Greetings. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first lecture of our new series, Arts at Graham. My name is Emily Lynn Osborne, and I am the Interim Dean of the Graham School of Continuing Professional and Liberal Studies. I am also a professor here in the Department of History at the University of Chicago. In a sign of the times, I will also state that I have been having internet glitches. And in case my internet goes out, our Director of Academics, Zoe Eisenman, is at the ready to take over this introduction. You have been listening to a string quartet, number one in A major, opus four, composed by Alexander von Zem Zemlinski and performed by the LaSalle Quartet. That musical selection is not coincidental to the topic of our lecture tonight. Zemlinski was, born Jew was Jewish and he was born and raised in Austria. We will be learning much more about this milieu shortly from Professor David Levine. First, a note about the format of this presentation today. This is a webinar. We are recording it. So that, may, we, so that we, we were recording this presentation so that we may post it online for people to watch at a later date. You, you are not able to use your microphone and your camera is turned off. You are able to communicate with the moderators and ask questions of our speakers through the question and answer box. We encourage you to do so. Professor Levine will take breaks during his talk to answer questions from the audience. We will likely not be able to answer all of your questions, but when one of the moderators does ask a question, we will read your name. You'll find the button to open the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Now, for those of you who are new to the University of Chicago Graham School, I'll take a minute to tell you who we are, what we do, and how this series came about. I will then introduce our speaker, respondent, my fellow moderator, and our webinar logistician. The Graham School functions, as I often say, as the front door of the University of Chicago. We bring the world to the University of Chicago and the world to you. The Graham School offers a range of classes and courses of study through the liberal arts, from degrees to certificate programs to non-credit bearing open courses that are, as the name suggests, open to anyone. In all of our offerings, we strive to connect with curious, engaged individuals, with people who seek camaraderie and community through learning and who want to ask critical inquiring questions about the world around us. It is from this foundation that we partnered with cultural institutions from across the university to launch Arts at Graham. The pandemic has closed many of the spaces that we hold dear, those wellsprings of our shared humanity, movie houses and theaters, museums and bookstores and performance halls, those sites that bring us together in cohorts of common interest and audiences of engagement. In this time when people are encouraged to practice distance and isolation to serve the public good, we thought that we could creatively and fruitfully come together to explore and share the different ways that human beings express their culture, experiences, and perspectives. This week we do so in partnership with Court Theater, the University of Chicago's professional theater. Court is dedicated to innovation, inquiry, intellectual engagement, and community service. And this season, its director and staff had had to radically rethink how to do theater in the midst of pandemics. This reimagined 2021 season features conversations and talks with faculty and directors who will lead their audiences through deep dives into the worlds of production, playwrights, and performances. Tonight, we will have a taste of that initiative with a talk on Leopoldstadt, the latest play by Sir Tom Stockard. Professor David Levine is currently serving as senior advisor to the Provost for Arts at the University of Chicago. He is also the Alex. Sorry. Here we are. Now I've, I, I realize this is not working as I thought it would. So I would, I'm going to proceed nonetheless. Um, David Levine is currently serving as senior advisor to the Provost for Arts at the University of Chicago. He is also the Addie Clark Harding Professor in the Department of Germanic Studies in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies and the Committee on Theater and Performance Studies. In other words, he has no shortages of affiliations. Before joining the Provost's office, he was the founding director of the Richard and Mary Gray Center for Arts and Inquiry, 
This experimental center is devoted to fostering collaborations between artists and scholars. David has written several books on opera and performance, including Unsettling Opera, staging Mozart, Verdi, Wagner, and Zemlinsky. He has also served as a dramaturg for ballet productions and operas in Germany and the United States. Responding to his lecture, we will be joined by Charles, or Charlie Newell. Charlie is the Marilyn Vital Artistic Director at Court Theater, where he has directed numerous Stoppard plays, most recently, The Hard Problem. He has won numerous honors, including the Stage Directors and Choreographers Foundation Zelda Ficklan Handler Award, which rewards outstanding transformative directors for their creativity, artistry, and influence on the arts. Two more introductions are also in order. My fellow moderator is Joel Rohn. Joel is a fourth-year graduate student in the Department of English, where he studies historical representation, civil rights nostalgia, and identity discourse in African-American letters after the Cold War. Also in attendance is Gus Moss, who is the Associate Director of the Masters in Liberal Arts here at the Graham School. And Gus is the master behind the, the, the scenes of this webinar, and we thank him for being there for us. David, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Emily, and uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, it's a delight to be here in cyberspace with uh, all of you um, and, uh, and for the invitation to talk about this really interesting piece, um, which has, in addition to the technical challenges of us thinking together about a piece that we have not yet seen and that most of us have not yet read, um, there's the real complication of uh, thinking about something that we really all have to imagine when it's theater and really the job of theater, of course, is uh, to join us in that imagination. So I wonder whether it wouldn't make sense for us to think about this event as a kind of laboratory, um, uh, a laboratory of and for interpretation in advance of a production. Of course, um, our conversation today about Leopold Stadt um, it's not a conventional lecture, in part because it's in cyberspace, but also it's actually a, a conversation, a conversation uh, between me and Charlie Newell. It is a thrill to be in any room, including a virtual room with Charlie, who, as you all know, surely, uh, has uh, been an extraordinarily influential and important director in Chicago uh, at Court Theatre. Um, and uh, it is at Court Theater that uh, production of Leopoldstadt was in the making. And when the pandemic hit, the question became, okay, now what? And of course, Court Theater being inventive as it is, figured, well, let's figure out a way to engage this material and engage our audiences with this material. Um, uh, look, I've dealt with a lot of artistic directors in my life. Some of them are like, German professors, somewhat forbidding and somewhat intimidating. Um, Charlie is neither of these things. He's engaging quick and sharp. Um, and my, uh, our thought was, why don't we talk and think together, uh, an academic uh, and an artist, about this material with all of you? Of course, if we were in an auditorium, we would do this in real time and in space uh, that we share. Uh, but we'll try to make the most of the technological shortcomings of the event. Um, so my thanks to Charlie for agreeing to this uh, somewhat comical arrangement uh, where uh, we're in our little uh, spheres, our little bubbles, and we'll try to make the conversation happen. Here's how I propose to proceed. Um, Emily had asked me whether I wouldn't perhaps start by explaining a little bit what it is that I do as a professor, what is the kind of research that I do, uh, and how does it intersect with the topic of the evening? I'll do that relatively quickly, um, and that'll be our first section. Um, in this case, the question being, how does textual interpretation work in the seminar room, and how does it work in the rehearsal room? But you see, as soon as we start thinking about it in the rehearsal room, the fact of Charlie's presence becomes all the more uh, compelling because he'll have, I think, uh, exciting and different things to say uh, about the process. From there, what I would propose we do 
is engage, it is after all the University of Chicago, engage in a, in a collective reading, which is to say, uh, and with apologies in advance for the inevitable technological snafus that are sure to arise, but I've got some PowerPoint slides with the opening stage setting for, uh, for Leopoldstadt, for this play. And it just seems to me like for us to begin to make sense of this piece, um, I think we should try to make sense of the opening uh, set design and stage design, the opening, uh, the opening description with which uh, Stoppard begins the play. Um, there are, of course, other ways we would do this. We could do this as a post-show discussion, but for that, we can't be in a pandemic. Or we could do this after watching a production that's previously been recorded, but for that, we would need an older production, an older piece. This is a contemporary piece. There aren't recordings of it. So we have, and it hasn't been published in the United States, so we couldn't really ask all of you to read it. So we figured, let's do the, the discovering together and see how and whether that works. As Emily mentioned, we wanted to invite all of you to post questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You'll see there's a little Q&A icon and you can click there and type up a question and send it in. Um, and uh, Charlie um, is here with us and uh, you can address your questions to him or to me or to both of us. Uh, and we'll simply try to make, uh, make this fly. Um, one other thought. Um, Emily mentioned, and I think she's really right about this, that it makes the most sense if we take brief breaks, uh, take questions, but also just give people an opportunity to maybe stretch their legs and gather their thoughts, uh, get a drink of water. So um, that's what we'll plan to do. Um, I'll start off with a brief account of how I got to where I am uh, to a, a preoccupation with questions of textuality and performance uh, at the University of Chicago. And then we'll just jump uh, right in to thinking about Leopoldstadt. Um, Charlie's got some helpful materials for us in the process. Um, he's going to offer a brief biographical account of Tom Stoppard. Um, it's an extraordinarily interesting biography, but more importantly, for our purposes, it's an extraordinarily relevant consideration for any engagement with Leopoldstadt, which is a not so encrypted engagement with Stoppard's own autobiography and the kind of lacunae that have arisen uh, that he lived with for, uh, for very many years, uh, being like Oedipus, entirely unfamiliar uh, with his past. And then having become aware of it, uh, became necessarily preoccupied with it. And then as any good playwright would, making art out of it. Um, uh, first off, a, a, a bit of an account of what it is that a dramaturg does uh, and how it is that that work is relevant for our purposes here today. Um, when I was uh, an undergraduate, I remember going with my parents to a production at the Metropolitan Opera of Verdi's Don Carlos. Uh, and because I had been trained well by my parents, I had gone the night before uh, and uh, listened to the piece and tried to figure out what it was about. And for those of you who don't know, Verdi's Don Carlos is a wild piece. It uh, starts out with a love scene between uh, uh, two young singers, um, uh, and it turns out, as they declare their love for each other, um, the war is over and uh, the princess who has just revealed herself as such is now to be betrothed not to the prince with whom she's off in the forest, but to the king, the prince's dad. And thus ensues mayhem, uh, an Oedipal relationship and all kinds of crazy tension. Um, it is an explosive piece. And I went the next evening to the opera with my parents, incredibly excited to see what would they would make at the Metropolitan Opera of this production, what the production would make of this material. And I went to the performance and was astonished. I mean, really utterly flummoxed because the production seemed to bear 
zero relationship to what I thought was interesting in the piece. Instead of the kind of interpersonal violence and intensity of exchange that marks the piece and that marks Verdi's writing, uh, that, that, that the condensation of emotional tension and emotional violence in the piece, I saw a kind of highly ordered and, and highly ornamental uh, production that seemed to, if anything, just repress all that was interesting in this piece. And I thought, okay, so there are two really interesting things going on here. On the one hand, I'm utterly fascinated that any production team could think that this was the way to render this material. Like, what process of work would have possibly led to that conclusion? To a conclusion that something which is so radically disordered and disorienting could be rendered in such highly ornamental and ordered form. And then I thought, well, that's that, you know, a production whose primary work seems to be the repression of all that which is dynamic in the piece, that's fascinating. But furthermore, it seems to me like what we need to do is completely rethink uh, what it is that we do in production. And so after being an undergraduate, I went off to Germany and worked in opera production for a couple of years and then shuttled back and forth between graduate school and working in opera production in Europe and figured, you know what, that is the most exciting thing I could possibly be doing, uh, is doing work in opera production that alerted audiences to all that is dynamic and con consternating and exciting and fresh in these pieces, especially in classical pieces. Um, uh, it seems to me, eventually I had to decide, do I continue doing work in production uh, or do I become an ap academic and think about this? Uh, and I eventually chose to become an academic and try to keep one foot in the production uh, in, the, in the door of the rehearsal room done that with moderate success. But I must say one of the reasons that I ended up coming to the University of Chicago was because I came here as a visitor. Um, I was teaching at Columbia University at the time in New York, and I came as a visitor. And while I was here, there was a production uh, at Court Theater on the campus of the University of Chicago um, uh, by Joanne Acolytis, um, an extraordinarily interesting director, uh, enormously influential director, who was also, as I recall, Charlie Newell's mentor. Um, and Court Theater invited my class over, which was a class in which we were trying to think about how we stage texts. And we engaged in a conversation with the actors and with the director, certainly with the production, trying to think about the work of production in interpretation on stage. The thought that a, a university could have at its disposal, in its immediate proximity, a world-class theater, a world-class theater that is interested in engaging uh, uh, academics uh, and the community, uh, in thinking about classics of theater, um, and thinking about the contemporary canon, expanding that canon and challenging our understanding of the canon, that struck me as an enormously exciting opportunity. Um, and it's, you know, it's been uh, almost 20 years since I came to the University of Chicago and the excitement has not waned uh, at the thought that our students and my colleagues uh, could be in an ongoing and fruitful dialogue that engages what's going on on the stage at Court Theater. And that, as you'll see on Thursday, uh, if you return for Ken Warren's um, uh, lecture here um, um, it, about August Wilson with Ron O.J. Parson, the, the dialogue is a vital one and it engages all of us at the point of intersection between the research that we do and engaging with um, interpretation in real time. Um, it is enormously exciting to have that opportunity. Um, and of course, it's a delight to be able to welcome uh, Charlie to the conversation. Um, Charlie, uh, having spoken so much about you, I wonder whether uh, you might in fact want to speak. <laughs> well, thank you, David. Um, yes, indeed. And I guess I do want to 
say a disclaimer as you describe, this is a brand new Tom Stoppard play. And as such, um, we've really just begun the investigation of the complexities contained therein. So what you'll hear tonight is a place where we are in our process and our thinking. Uh, and I must uh, do a shout out to uh, two University of Chicago students, one you already met, uh, Joel Rohn, the other is Cy Patch because of their dramaturgical support in, un in dissecting, if you will, even this text, and also most especially to Nora Titone, Court Theater's resident dramaturg. Um, David, I thought this is where I might speak a little of uh, Sir Tom's biography. Was that is that okay? Good. That would be ideal. Great. As many of you probably know, and you can look up many different articles about his very complicated journey and story, but uh, so this is just the basics. Um, he was born as Tomas Straussler in the former Czechoslovakia, but his family fled to Singapore as the Nazis invaded. Stoppard, his brother, and his mother left there just before the Japanese invasion in 1942. But his father, uh, Dr. Tomas Straussler, was killed. When, sorry, uh, Eugene Straussler is his father's name. When he was five, the family moved again. And here they went to India, where his mother married a British army major. And then in 1946, they moved to England. <laughs> This, this reminds me of a, a phrase that Sir Tom used in describing himself once as a bounced check. After his mother's death, he returned to Zlin in the Czech Republic to discover more about his family history in which his four grandparents and much of his family of his parents' generation died in the camps. He says now, quote, in the long run, that visit accounted for this play, I guess. It's not about me, but it's a play I couldn't have written if I haven't lived the life that fate has dealt me. We can say more, David, about how he discovered and how the play reflects, while it's not an autobiographical play, it is certainly a play informed by his life and about his family. Another phrase he used, it's a play that contains elements of unfinished business. He describes it as a play of full evening of theater. While not a tragedy as a play, it's about an unthinkable tragedy itself. Um, so there's some introductory. So thanks, uh, Charlie. Um, the original title of this play uh, was a family album. Um, and in fact, uh, as we, as the play gets underway, uh, we encounter the matriarch of the family uh, who is attempting to put together a family album. And the work that she undertakes at the outset of the play will be fundamentally uh, akin to the work that the play will undertake, which is to say she thinks about and attempts to piece together the remnants, the traces of her family. And at the same time, she's wondering about what can be remembered, who can be remembered, and how easily all of it can be forgotten. And given Tom Stoppard's own personal history, in which for many years, his family history had been erased, and the need in later life, in late life, that he suddenly confronts of putting together a family album with participants and photos and components that are wholly unfamiliar to him. Um, I mean, it's really quite an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary biography in which the family tree that you thought you had is completely uprooted. And in its place, you take your place as a branch for an entirely different tree. Um, that is central, it seems to me, to the animating spirit of this piece um, and, uh, and will be, it seems to me, the sort of insecurity of that which we think is secure and the unknowability of that which we think we know 
will be sort of central to the, uh, to the dramaturgical orientation of this play. Um, I wanted to think for a moment about Leopoldstadt as a name. So Leopoldstadt, um, right, so it's just, it means literally Leopold Town. Um, Leopold Town is uh, the name of a neighborhood, a very famous neighborhood in Vienna. And the play is set in Vienna, as we'll see shortly as we take a look uh, at the stage directions together. But Leopoldstadt would be sort of like saying in the United States, um, you know, the Lower East Side, or maybe for those of us in Chicago, uh, like something between Maxwell Street and Skokie, which is to say Maxwell Street is the place where in the 19th century when the first wave of Eastern European Jewish immigrants came uh, to Chicago, they set up shop literally and figuratively in Maxwell Street. So the name of this play, Leopoldstadt, it evinces a, a place but also an era. Um, it's the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto, and as such, you would imagine, since it's the Lower East Side and we're starting out in the late 19th century, that the curtain would open and we would be in the gutter or some equivalent of the gutter, but far from it. In fact, the play opens not in Leopoldstadt, but in fact on, if we go back to the New York analogy, if Leopoldstadt designates the Lower East Side, the curtain opens on the Upper East Side uh, in a grand, maybe the Upper West Side because it's so emphatically a Jewish family or in Chicago for Chicago's purposes, maybe historically the place where the immigrants went when they moved out of Maxwell Street was pretty much down to Hyde Park to these Grand or Kenwood, these grand three flats and, uh, and houses on the water uh, that were the destination for the upwardly mobile recent immigrants. Um, and the world of Leopoldstadt that unfolds in Tom Stoppard's play is marked by this displacement. That is the displacement between where you came from and where you are and the insecurity of those two things. Because in some sense, even if you're in Hyde Park, Maxwell Street is in some sense the label that introduces you. And in some sense, even if you've arrived, you're never safe. Uh, I think one of the things that this play really underscores, what it really accounts for as so much of Greek tragedy with which I think it's in conversation suggests is those who are at the highest point are always fundamentally insecure at the moment at which they feel their security most poignantly. Um, and in this case, the family, which in 1898, and even in the 1920s, is feeling the stature that it has achieved, that stature is about to be completely uh, undercut by the onset of uh, totalitarianism and the anti-Semitism of fascism as it arises. And the play chronicles both the rise of this family and then its decimation. Um, and it does so given the familiarity of that trajectory in ways that I think speak to the fragility of the human condition in ways that aren't particular, it seems to me, to the family that is uh, described here, but that resonate in ways that Oedipus's story resonates, uh, in ways that uh, the tragedies of the 19th century uh, resonate. Um, uh, it seems to me in that sense, it makes perfect sense that Charlie and Court Theater would be fascinated by this piece, in part because Charlie, as Emily Osborne mentioned in her introduction, is one of the foremost interpreters of Tom Stoppard has done, I think I counted six productions, although maybe more of Stoppard's pieces. Um, and so a new Stoppard piece is of course a major event, but it's not a major event for any old theater. And my guess is it's a particularly exciting event uh, for this theater. Um, so maybe we could take that as an opportunity, Charlie, to ask you 
uh, to speak for a moment about, uh, about your attraction to this piece. Well, um, as I mentioned, in just beginning this absolute pleasure of diving into this text, um, and because I th from my point of view, uh, it is his most personal, even though it is not autobiographical. Um, the, every time I read it, I discover more layers of meaning about the choices that he's making. You mentioned the name. No part of the play actually takes place in Leopoldstadt. You hear about people that go there but you'd think it's the title of the play, so it must be the location of the play. It's not. But if you dig even just one layer down, the character that, again, it's not autobiographical, but that it is most parallel in the journey that I described in Tom's biography is a character whose name is Leo. So I'll let David, the German scholar, help me understand how Leo Holdstadt, and what does that mean in terms of the character of Leo in the play? I also should have put a disclaimer, by the way, on my pronunciation, even of Sir Tom's name, which is one of the reasons why I prefer to call him Sir Tom. Um, I do want to just give a little context, if I may, David, after gaining permission to do the Chicago premiere of a number of uh, Sir Tom's plays which was such a gracious thing for him to do for court theater. Many other theaters were competing for those rights. And following um, uh, when I was invited by the Goodman Theater to direct Rock and Roll, which of course had a tremendous amount of the uh, politics of his upbringing in Czechoslovakia, et cetera, and his love for music. I learned recently from him that um, uh, he played rock and roll music the entire, much of the time he was writing that play. When it came to Leopoldstadt, he wrote almost exclusively in silence. Um, what was most gratifying was then when, um, through the generosity of the university and the court board, my wife and I, Kate, went to London back in, I think, 2007, 2008, and saw the premiere of uh, Tom's then most recent play, The Hard Problem besides the pleasure of doing that play at court and bringing a production to Chicago, thanks to the dramaturgy, that, uh, again, led by Nora Titone, uh, in which we shared with Sir Tom our dramaturgy. That's a scary prospect to share one's dramaturgy with such, a, such an incredible artist. Uh, and uh, his compliments to us about how we not only uh, portrayed that production, but also understood the biography that's inherent, even though it's not obvious, one needs to dig deep into it. I'm also thrilled to let everyone know who's on this webinar with us, over 300 of you. Um, it's my understanding that come October, the first authorized biography of Sir Tom will be published. So we can all look forward to that. Um, every time one looks at a certain structure and context within the play, one has to not only try, and it takes many, 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 many readings to track how perfectly constructed each of the moments and scenes are and how they set up what is gonna then become the inevitability of the events of the play. But in this play, more than any other in my experience, the benefit of understanding Sir Tom's own personal biography adds a whole other layer and depth of meaning. Uh, as you know, uh, his reputation as, uh, was begun uh, with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern as a young playwright, and often his work is celebrated for its wit, its uh, intellectual stimulation, and its cleverness. It's been my experience that the more one can dig deeper into the emotional foundation, which often does come from the personal experience of the playwright, even though it's not explicit, then the greater are, are the benefits of experiencing the play. Uh, so for me, this play is just 
a smorgasbord of delight and deep complicated meaning and understanding uh, uh, as we begin our process to really unlock some of it. You know, it occurs to me that um, uh, as we're talking about the play, it would be helpful, of course, to give our um, audiences uh, a, a plot synopsis. And yet, <laughs> so look, it really is not a cop out to say that is an extremely difficult thing to do, because really what the plot of the play is, is an account of multiple generations of a family from the 1890s to the 1950s. So essentially in three different iterations, we are introduced to three different scenes of this family's history. Um, but that is really the plot. It is a domestic scene that we experience in each of these cases. It's an interior. And we see the exchanges among and between the characters who descend from the uh, matriarch whom we're introduced to and her children and grandchildren at the beginning of the play. So they grow up, they have children and grandchildren. And essentially we're introduced to a landscape of a single family. And that family, as it travels through time, travels through fortunes. But we remain uh, in one place uh, and travel through the family in more or less, uh, you know, the place, the space of a family. So look, it really is not a cop out to say that is the plot of Leopoldstadt. It is an account of a family's destiny. Uh, and as such, it's an account of basically, you know, the history of Europe from the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century as told through the tale of a single, uh, of a single family. Um, I'm aware that I promised people that we would take a brief break. Uh, and, uh, and it seems to me like now would be a good time to do so. Um, if there are questions for us at this point, um, Charlie and I are, well, are, are happy to take them. But what I would like to propose is that um, we, uh, uh, that we take a brief break, let's say just two minutes or so, so folks can stretch their legs. And then when we return, what I'd like to propose is that all of us, I'll share my screen, take a look at the opening stage directions for this play and think together uh, about what it is that we're reading when we read these stage directions. That is, what do they tell us? What do they introduce us to? Um, and my thought is that in doing this together, I think we'll dive into the world of Leopoldstadt in a way that I hope uh, will be illuminating. So let's reconvene in two minutes. And in the meantime, I'll try to pull up um, a PowerPoint screen of a first slide of the stage directions of Leopoldstadt. Thanks so much, everybody. Charlie, I wonder if I could ask you a question while we await David. Yes. I, I just wonder when you think about putting on Stoppard plays, or this one in particular, Leopoldstadt, what are the challenges or what are things that are particular to doing a Stoppard play that you've come to know and perhaps embrace, but also perhaps are challenging. Well, you got to do your homework and then do it again and then do it again. 
because there is so many multiple interpretations and meanings. I mean, I've been rereading this play multiple times and new things keep appearing that it, frankly are laying in plain sight <laughs> to find, but are not clear unless one does the homework. But following that is then what I was talking about, the emotion. In other words, how, how do we take all of the detail and the specificity that the homework reveals to us in the plotting, in the context, in the references, in the puns, in the structure of the language. But then as for the actors, where's the heartbeat? Where's the emotion? Where's the, the humanity underneath and within all of that? Um, that's the most challenging part and the most rewarding. So if you can combine those two things in my simplistic metaphor of the heart and the head, then, then, then it, the play starts to really become, as he says, it's the play is a text, theater is an event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, something along that those lines, there is a request if the, if it's at all possible to read any dialogue from the, the play, if that will be happening. Um, is David coming back with us? I'm here. I'm You're back. There. Are you at the ready or should we, because I think Joel has a question. We have some lots of questions flowing in from the audience. Right. Um, so uh, happy to uh, take questions and happy to then proceed also with uh, a, a look at the stage directions. So here, here's the problem. Um, normally, as I said in our uh, opening, in my opening comments, normally we would share the text of the piece, but the text has not been released in the United States and therefore it's not possible for us to share the text um, without violating copyright in the United States. So it is, however, possible to share the stage directions. So that's why we're tr basically just trying to make do here um, uh, in order to uh, both accommodate, you know, the, the, the deep desire to engage the material, but not run afoul of copyright law. Um, so thus the proposal um, to share with everyone else the text of the opening, because we can, and then to think about that. Um, if we were, it, it's not really possible for us to share the text uh, of the play, um, uh, although it will be soon when it's published, um, uh, when it's published in, in the UK. That having been said, Charlie and I discussed uh, the possibility of his uh, doing a reading uh, from the text because um, he's a director, he can do such things. Um, so maybe Charlie, without wanting to put you on the spot, if you'd be willing to uh, offer us a reading uh, from the text, that would be brilliant. Yes, I'd be happy to. I, I ain't no actor, but I love reading Stoppard. Um, maybe a little context too, because one of the ways that this play came about was through a scrapbook of photos that Sir Tom saw, I believe, when he was in his 60s uh, of his mother, of his father uh, from Czechoslovakia. So this remembering people through their photos in photo albums uh, is coming from a very specific event that led him to uh, begin to really understand uh, his heritage as a Jew. Um, so this is a, a brief section of text in which, as you mentioned, David, at the very beginning of the play, uh, the matriarch, Grandma Amelia, is putting a photo album together. Grandma. I've been writing in names that are missing the ones I know, which is by no means all of them. That's what happens, you see. First, there's no need to write who they are because everyone knows that's great aunt Sophia or cousin Rudy. And then only some of us know. And already we're asking, who's that with Gertrude? And I don't remember this man with the little dog. And you don't realize how fast they're disappearing from being remembered. 
everyone was mad to have a photograph when I was a girl. It was like a miracle. And you had to go to a photographer's to pose for him. Wedding couples, soldiers in their first uniforms, children in front of painted scenery. And always women dressed up for the carnival ball, posing with a Greek pillar. Later, when we had a camera, there were too many pictures to keep in the album. Holiday pictures with real scenery, swimming pictures, pictures of children in pinafores and later hosen, like little Austrians. Here's a couple waving goodbye from the train, but who are they? No idea. That's why they're waving goodbye. It's like a second death to lose your name in a family album. Thanks, Charlie. Um, uh, it's, um, it's a really uh, evocative moment uh, in the piece um, because of course it resonates with the history that uh, we've been describing here, a history in which this question of who we are and where we come from is so tenuous. Um, uh, I'm going to try to share my screen with, as I say, all due apologies for the technical complications of uh, attempting to do so. Um, uh, and as we do so, the hope is that we'll be able to take a look um, at um, my PowerPoint. Um, uh, although, strangely enough, uh, it's it's not appearing on my screen at the moment. Uh, here we go. Um, so uh, the hope is that you can see uh, this opening text um, from Leopold Stadt. And what I was proposing we do is uh, take a look at this um, together, think about it together, and talk about it together. Um, so uh, Leopold Stadt, scene one. Vienna, December of 1899. At the prosperous end of Viennese bourgeoisie, 12 members of two intermarried Jewish families and a housekeeper cook, Poldi, a parlor maid, Hilde, and a nursemaid, Jana, are variously occupied among the overcrowded, fussy furnishings of an apartment off the Ringstrasse. I'm going to move on from there to the opening, which has almost two pages of, uh, of directions. Charlie, do you want to go ahead and read a bit more, if only because uh, surely your voice is more mellifluous in its account than mine? Where would you like me to pick up? The combined families right. are... Okay. And I can respond to the specifics if you like, David, or just keep reading. You tell me. Well, so what I thought we might do is read to the end of this page and then okay. just think okay. about it uh, okay. and talk about it. The combined families are eight grown-ups and four children, plus an infant in a bassinet. The, the apartment, spread over one floor of a grand high ceiling block, is the home of the Mertz family, the occupancy now reduced to the matriarch, Grandma Amelia Mertz, her son Herman, and his wife Gretel, and their son, Jacob, who is eight. Go ahead, Dave. Beautiful. Um, two familial groups are the visitors, Herman's sister, Eva, with her husband, Ludwig, and their two children, Pauli, aged eight, and the baby, Nelly. Wilma is Ludwig's sister, married to Ernst. They have two daughters, Sally and Rosa, who are twins and younger than Jacob. Finally, there's Wilma's unmarried sister, Hannah, who is 18. Um, I want to pause there and invite Charlie to, uh, to just think out loud about what it is we're being given to see here and what you notice, what you maybe stumble on um, in this initial account, and then maybe we can just go on uh, in those directions. Well, as a director, reading this text, I immediately took out my pencil and my paper and started to draw a family tree, which again is a scene that is repeated at the very end of the play by a character for the Tom Stoppard stand-in of Leo. 
I also am struck by, like in Arcadia, most of this play takes place in one location and you keep rec returning to the place at different moments in history. I'm also struck by that in this scene and in others, and why I have no idea, and it's a part of the thrill of investigation, that there are eight adults and four children plus one. That's the truth, that's the case in other scenes as well, but it's not the same eight adults and four children. Why is that repeat there? I don't know, but it's clearly not, I believe, or I choose to believe, it's not unintentional. Um, it, it, I know you, many of you maybe won't be able to see this, but I have multiple versions of family trees because as soon as one starts to think about how to cast this play, you got to figure out who's related to whom. And already in the first half page of Stage Directions, we've got a whole family tree to figure out. Um, those are a couple of thoughts, David. Uh, thanks, Charlie. Um, at the same time, I guess I wanted to think a little bit about the specificity uh, of the directions, that is, what it is that the play is noticing. Um, the first thing that it notices is its location on the Ringstrasse, which in Vienna, as many of you will know, is the kind of wannabe Champs-Élysées of Vienna. Um, as a result, all of a sudden, you know, we find ourselves in opulence. Uh, and we're told that the apartment, which is spread over a floor of a grand high ceilinged block, is the home of the Mertz family. So while on the one hand, we're in the address, you know, the, the, um, we're sort of in the zip code of the, of the high and mighty, what seems odd is that we're all of it, we're immediately told that the occupancy has now been reduced to the matriarch. Uh, the grandma and her son and his wife. And I guess I wonder about that simultaneity of grandiloquence or grandiosity and reduction, um, where you would sort of uh, imagine that the space would be fully occupied, but it's occupied as we're told by two familial groups who are visitors. And um, the idea that they are visitors will be further it seems to me modified in the stage directions to come. So if it's okay, I would say, let's move on to the next, uh, to the next uh, set of stage directions and see what they suggest to us. So Gretel is Gentile, so is Ernst. Poldi, aged about 40, and Hilde are in the Merz household. Jana has come with the baby, but is supervising the children. The grown-ups have been served coffee in dainty cups. Several balls are in the air from the word go, and little or no sense can be made except that chocolate cake with whipped cream is going round on little plates delivered by Poldi and Hilda, and a Christmas tree is being decorated by the four children overseen by Jana. Okay, so there is all kinds of stuff going <laughs> on here. And I wonder, um, Charlie, what, what sort of hits you in uh, encountering these stage directions? Well, to the very first thing you read, uh, who is Jewish and who is not? And that question is throughout the play and one's own identity and one's self-identity. The other thing that the stage direction sets up is a moment where one of the children wants to put the star onto the Christmas tree, but makes the mistake of putting the star of David on top of the Christmas tree. So you're getting the combination of these rituals and these symbols uh, already mixed up in this uh, uh, opulent room. Yeah, I wonder, um, thanks, Charlie, That's, that makes great sense. I mean, the, the, the baldness of saying, Gretel is Gentile, so is Ernst. I mean, it's like, wait, what? Like, how is that? Like, what? Um, uh, but it does, it seems to me, immediately key us in to the stakes uh, and the historical particularity of the moment, which is, you know, that in this culture, uh, the question, as you say, of identity is, is paramount. 
Um, and if it isn't paramount for the players, it's paramount for the society in which they play. Um, there's another thing that I wanted to uh, note here and ask uh, whether it resonates for you, Charlie, as you contemplate a production. The notion that several balls are in the air from the word go, right? Yeah. Because it yeah. seems to me that with Stafford, there are always several balls in the air from yeah. the word go. Yeah. And here, that notion is literalized. Like exactly. there are actually several balls in the air, but my sense is that the ambition of his pieces is always to have a kind of meta level on which the piece operates. That's one ball, the sort of meta theatrical. Then there's the naturalistic, the, the, the sort of descriptive, the dramatic. Um, but then there's also just a, a kind of conceptual level. And I guess, you know, identity is up in the air here. Mm -hmm. Wealth mm -hmm. is up in the air. Yeah. Mm, stability and one's place in the world is up in the air. Um, I, I don't know if you had further thoughts uh, about any of that. Um, well, you can imagine as an audience member watching this as a piece of theater, it's like you're drinking from a very complicated <laughs> fire hose of many, many layers and many things coming at you at once. Um, everything that's happening is important and is related and payoff is not the right word, is connected to events that will occur. Um, I'm particularly struck by something that took me a long time. One often feels really not very bright when one is <laughs> uh, first approaching these texts because later in the stage directions, there are three books that are referred to. They're not named, but those three books are pivotal to many moments that then will follow. And it took me a while to figure out which books they were, but only as a result of the events that follow, as opposed to Stoppard telling you which those books are in the stage directions. Absolutely, thank you. Um, uh, I wonder whether we might uh, take a look uh, uh, or think in fact about, um, you know, the way in which we travel from Gretel is Gentile to the final um, uh, observation, at least in this slide, um, uh, which is to say um, that uh, the four children uh, overseen uh, by, uh, by their uh, nanny are decorating the tree. So, uh, so we have on the one hand an assertion of a kind of norm of Jewishness, and on the other hand we have the assertion of a norm of, you know, a, a, a prevailing Catholicism in Vienna uh, and in the culture of, uh, of Vienna. Um, uh, if we could, let's go on to the next slide um, and take a look uh, at these directions um, and, uh, and see what, uh, what we make of them. Um, uh, I'm happy to start reading, Charlie, but I'm going to have to uh, ask for your assistance, if you don't mind, if only to, um, uh, if only to enliven the process. Um, Grandma is at a table dispensing the chocolate cake, cutting slices and adding a large dollop of whipped cream to each plate. For this purpose, she has put aside the family photo album and a small bottle of white ink and a dip pen for writing captions on the black pages of the album and a handful of loose photos, old and new, snaps and studio photos with a supply of corner stickers. You wanna take it from there? Sure, Herman Solo is fulminating over a thin book, a pamphlet of 80 pages. Eva is confiding scandal to Gretel over another small book. Ernest is talking to Ludwig about a Ludwig about a third book. Ernst is, uh, sorry, Wilma is seated where she can talk to grandma or intervene in any squabbles between the children. She's turning the pages of the photo album. Hannah is playing the piano for herself. She's playing Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, which is Silent Night, right? Mm -hmm. um, silent Night, Holy Night, Stille Nacht, Silent Night, Heilige Nacht, Holy Night. You want to take it from there? 
Can I just go back a second? Please. There are then future stage directions where grandma is placed in the room. Other characters are intentionally placed in that same location with di by, for different reasons. Similarly, earlier, there's referen um, in the reference to the chocolate cake, David uh, will have to tell me because I've never been to Vienna, uh, uh, Demels, which is a famous patisserie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you learn at the end of the play that they no longer have any pastry, they only conserved tea. Whereas here, I could imagine that this chocolate cake came from that pas pastry shop. Uh, similarly, um, the, the references we hear later about not only a reference to Walpurgis Knock, but also to uh, Crystal Knock. So Silent Night, Holy Night being played as the underscore of this uh, uh, by the uh, musician Hannah. She's also a recurring and mu certain kinds of music that she's playing on the piano is a recurring thing that this is set, setting up. So everything is there for a purpose, I guess I'm trying to highlight. Yeah. Um, uh, the, should I go on? No, no, please do, yes. Yeah. The Christmas decorations come from a large box, silver balls, bells, streamers, paper chains, stale iced biscuits and chocolates shaped like little animals, soldiers, musical instruments, etc. Thus the chatter of the children finds room where it may over, under, and between grandma's instructions to Poldy, the proffering of cake and the receiving of cake, and much tete-a-tete -tete conversation as can be made out between the sisters-in-law, Eva and Gretel, and between the brothers-in-law, Ernest and Ludwig, all to the sound of Stillnach on the piano. Now stage that. <laughs> exactly. Good luck with that. Exactly. Um, um, so... You know, I think what we are introduced to here is a whole self-contained world, right? And uh, as we're introduced uh, to that world, there's a sense of a kind of um, cultural cross-currents of that world that the text notes, right? Around identity, who's Jewish and who isn't, around the Christmas tree, around the soundtrack, right? That is so... Uh, as the family convenes that is explicitly marked as Jewish, uh, uh, Silent Night is uh, sort of uh, on, uh, in the air um, and the Christmas tree is being decorated. It is at the intersection, therefore, of Catholic Vienna and uh, uh, Eastern European Judaism that the piece opens. Uh, and it will essentially explore the implications of that intersection for the course of the three major historic scenes that are to follow. Um, it strikes me that um, it would make sense, I think, for us uh, to try to take on some of the questions that have uh, come in. Charlie, did you wanna comment on any of that? Well, maybe because it's one of my more recent discoveries, I just, if I may take an, another moment. Um, the penultimate scene is the arrival of a character named the civilian in which the family is, is um, taken out of their home. Uh, this is in 1938. Uh, um, I think I'm, I wanna make sure I have the correct date. Yes, I do. And in that scene, the young Leo, the Tom Stoppard stand in, is holding a, a coffee cup, or, sorry, his uncle, Ludwig, the doctor, is holding a coffee cup and in a moment of fear and panic drops it to the floor. The young Leo picks it up, the broken pieces in his hand, and we learn and we discover that his hand is starting to bleed from the broken pieces out of sheer terror of what's going on. The doctor, Ludwig, then goes to the young Leo to repair, once the civilian Nazi is out of the home, goes to repair the young Leo's hand. That's what happens in the play. Here's what happened in life. <laughs> when Sir Tom went uh, back to Czechoslovakia, he met a woman who had cut her hand as a very young child. And she was treated by Dr. Eugene Straussler. And she showed 
her scar and to Tom at age 60. He had stitched her hand together and quote, she holds her hand out to me, which still holds the mark. I touch it. In that moment, I am surprised by grief, a small catching up of all the grief I owe. I have nothing that came from my father, nothing he owned, nothing he touched, but here is his trace, a small scar. That's beautiful. Thanks, uh, Charlie. And it renders the poignancy of that scene, right? I mean, it resonates, as you say, with that story. And yet it's also poignant in the play without that recollection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's as if Stoppard, you know, takes that moment and inserts it into the play so that we can, in some sense, share the experience uh, that he had. Um, uh, the experience of, of loss and recollection and, um, uh, and what it might mean to come face to face with that loss. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of questions uh, and, um, and I you know, love to uh, get to all of them, although I know that, um, uh, that we don't have enough time to do so. So let me just take um, one of them. Uh, uh, and just ask, um, Charlie, uh, Ken Murray asks, uh, in her New York Review of Books review, Kate Maltby remarks, quote, for all of its Vienna setting, or sorry, all of its Viennese setting, this is a profoundly English play, end quote. How do you approach that for a Chicago production? That's a great question, and, and it, it was f something that fueled much of our thinking about how do we approach the production, his text of rock and roll, which took place primarily in Czechoslovakia. Um, I, you know, the simple answer is very carefully, but always go back to the text, always go back to the references that he's making and, and make sure that you're serving those. We don't, uh, I don't, uh, often think, well, I need to make this somehow relatable to a Chica specifically Chicago audience, but rather be true to the what is only an interpretive response as a director, what one could imagine is uh, the playwright's intention. The extraordinary opportunity and privilege that I've had in my career is many, but certainly one of the highlights, if not the, was the phone conversations that Sir Tom and I have had about rock and roll, about the hard problem, and I hope in some time in the future that we can have that conversation about this play. Um, thanks. That's uh, uh, you know I wonder um, if you have thoughts in terms of setting, in terms of location. You know, do you envision this as necessarily? Uh, you know, because it's very early in the piece's life. Um, you know, is there some pressure to, in some sense, set it as it's described? Um, uh, because you know, it's uh, it's an early production. Or do you feel free uh, to uh, to think about what the appropriate referent might be? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and I guess you know, I, I don't mean this as a rule. I mean this for this piece. Yeah. Well, I've only seen photos. I saw a question in the chat about, did I see the London production? And the answer is no, it got closed down after, soon after it opened back in January of 2020, how long ago that now feels. And there is hope that there will be a return of that production to London and then let us hope to New York. And then if, if the gods <laughs> are kind to us, might uh, we in Chicago get a chance to have a Chicago premiere of this play? Um, that said, the photographs of what looked like a beautiful production, uh, certainly to my response, one of the questions I had, because there are moments when there are a few people on stage and then there needs to be like 15 or 20 people in the middle of a Seder. And how do you do that and keep the momentum and the journey moving forward? I'm sure they figured it out. I didn't see it. But one of the thoughts I've had as a director is how do you create a space 
that is as fluid as the text needs to be, uh, as it changes uh, not so much location, but what's in that space. So for those of you who've seen Augie March or seen some of our other work, certainly the hard problem was uh, a singular set that we could move very quickly from scene to scene. So there's a similar kind of fleetness of it so that the words, the words, the words, and the emotion is primary rather than a lot of scene changes. And um, Charlie, I wonder whether the kind of flexibility and malleability that you're describing also doesn't bear upon the sense that it's unclear at least to my mind, whether what we're talking about is actually historically specific or conjured and fantasized, mm -hmm. right? That is, yeah. um, it seems to me insofar as so much of Stoppard's relationship to this Jewish past is necessarily one of imagination yeah. um, for a past that he didn't know about, then doesn't this piece, but then again, doesn't all theater in some sense sort mm -hmm. of invent this past? And to what extent does the impossibility of staging it bear traces of, in a sense, the kind of phantasmatic quality of the piece? Mm -hmm. uh, it's imagine, it's 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 derivation from imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly that the aesthetics of that kind of production are very appealing. In other words, these are memories that are kind of forcing themselves to make be manifest. Uh, the final scene of the play set in 1955 is the simplest and has three characters on stage and the lines and the, the literal text is profoundly moving while being the most, I mean, if you looked at it just on the page, it's the fewest words per, uh, this is so stupid way to describe it, but I don't know how else to do it without yeah. showing you the text. It's the fewest the shortest lines of the entire play for a number of pages at the end. So how do you arrive at that moment? I understand from interviews that he gave that Sir Tom was concerned about, will that scene uh, uh, um, continue to work even as he found it early on? And every time I read it, and I understand every time he saw the production, uh, tears were flowing. So I want to just thank the uh, thank our listeners, our our uh, participants and guests in this uh, uh, in today's um, uh, lecture and discussion. I mean, these are really fascinating questions. I'm really sorry not to be able to get to more of them, but let's take a shot. Uh, Angie Heisler um, asks, "How does one show that Gretel is Gentile on stage?" when the audience doesn't see the stage directions, which is, you know, a really great question. <laughs> it's like, okay, so you read and, you know, okay, so we have read and we've been alerted that Gretel uh, is Gentile, but how do, you, how do you go about showing that or do you? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I mean, some of the tools we have, of course, is what is unique and specific about her dialect, her accent, uh, one could imagine her biography is that she was raised Catholic. One could also imagine um, things such as hair color and fabric of her clothes that distinguishes her in different, that is in some way different, even though she's obviously of the world. Um, and the most important thing is the actors, this is a, again, not a great word to use, but the actor's affect, the actor's kind of energy, and what, how might that be, without obviously falling into stereotypes, how might that have some nuance that um, is useful? It then starts to become clear in the play by the way that she is behaving. Uh, and here's one of the magical boxes that one, when one reads the play I, I offered to you. She has, well, <laughs> There's, there's boxes within boxes here. Some of you may know Arthur Schnitzer's play La Ronde, in which it's a series of scenes of two characters. And the first character, first scene is two people meeting and it results in sexual liaison, sexual congress. The next scene has one of those characters and then a new character 
have a, have a different journey to sexual congress. And by the time you get to the end of the play, the character at the beginning is having sex with a character at the end, if you track all that. So there's this, this structure. Well, in Stoppard's play, one can make the argument that he began in the plotting of the play to write a version of La Ronde because the, the young um, uh, uh, military, uh, uh, not Jewish uh, character begins to have a flirtation with a young uh, daughter, uh, Hannah, and then does uh, bed Gretel uh, in the following scene and then has a scene with Herman, the, f the husband of Gretel. So if you follow all that, if that made any sense, my point is even within that construct, you learn at the end of the play, something about the genetic makeup of this character uh, uh, that, well, I don't want to ruin the surprise, but you don't know it, that you, you're so focused on other things, you don't realize until the end of the play that this, uh, um, uh, the, the profound implications of this, who is the, what is the genetic makeup of the son of Herman and Gretel? Um, uh, I'm guessing here just by the email address, we don't have a name, but it looks like it might be uh, Dana Levinson. Uh, who writes, you know, how has Judaism been a part of Stoppard's prior work? And if Stoppard had not actually said so, is there anything in the play that suggests that this is his last work? Um, do you have any thoughts about that, uh, Charlie? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, Dana and, and others, in a number of interviews, there's been a question about, is this his last play? God willing, that's not the case, but there were five years between, I believe five years uh, between, or no more, between The Hard Problem and this play. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so there has been some question about, is this maybe his last play? Um, and I would describe without uh, a whole lot of specificity, Dana, that the question of Judaism is rife throughout many of his plays. Um, I've been looking at uh, his play, Every Good Boy Deserves Favor, uh, which uh, is one of the plays that I've not done of his that certainly um, uh, is, is one of those, so. Thanks. Um, um, and uh, is, have there been any changes that uh, Stoppard has introduced to the script, you know, now that he's, uh, you know, the piece has been produced uh, in the UK. Uh, that is, are you sort of in conversation at all about what he might want to adjust? Um, have you have you gotten any? Uh, I'm paraphrasing uh, here a question that Shelley Horwitz posted uh, to the Q&A. Well, as some of you may know, uh, the recent revival of his play from years ago, Travesties, which we've had the pleasure of doing twice, actually, at Court Theater, one of the few plays in my tenure we've done twice. Patrick Marber, the playwright, was the director. And in that production of Travesties, there were further rewrites. And uh, forgive me for not knowing the details, but I think within the last five or six years, that new production and therefore the new text of Travesties is now available. Uh, Patrick Marber was the director of Leopoldstadt. And I can only imagine that he and Tom, Sir Tom will continue to develop the text. They've had a lot of COVID time to think about that question. And so when it returns in London and travels to New York, um, what I, again, forgive me for talking about my own experience, but it's related. Even as the Goodman presented rock and roll following the Broadway production, uh, thanks to his generosity, Sir Tom uh, heard me speak about how some scenes were being received in the Goodman Chicago production. And so he suggested and, uh, that we make some tweaks and changes, nothing major, but some tweaks and changes to the text. My point in all of that is to say, there's a whole other experience that he 
has often spoken about glowingly about being the playwright in the rehearsal room and how and when can he contribute to the to the dynamic process of what the text is and what the rehearsal needs. Um, uh, we, Patricia Ahrens just uh, posted a question to the chat asking uh, whether the Efrusi family that lived in Vienna and was written about in The Hair with the Amber Eyes might have been a reference for uh, Tom Stoppard. And I think uh, my recollection is that Stoppard mentions uh, that book uh, along with several others, um, historical uh, uh, novels and uh, treatments um, that allowed him to get a sense of Vienna uh, and the culture of Vienna. Um, uh, my sense being that Stoppard is unabashed in his kind of voracious reading, but also in, in admitting to the sources and the influences for the work that he does. Um, um, so, um, uh, the, the, um, another question that has come up is, um, whether, um, uh, there is anything, uh, Stephen Andes uh, posed this question early on in the chat. Um, do you see anything uniquely related to the Jewish experience in Enlightenment Europe, which would seem to be the manifest topic, you know, of the piece, as opposed to a story of anyone living in several worlds at once? Right, so is this a particular piece? Is it a universal piece or is it some combination of those two? What would be your sense of that? Well, I am certainly not a, a scholar that would be learned enough to really understand the implications of that question. Um, what, and one of the great pleasures that uh, I look forward to uh, if and when we're able to do a full production here in Chicago is the ongoing relationships and faculty conversations and scholarship that Court Theater uniquely has as being part of the professional theater of the University of Chicago. Um, what I do know is that there has certainly been some, well, as I think many of you know, uh, the rise in uh, uh, anti-Semitic activity in the United States has been uh, increasing. And so I think um, there certainly is, I have a sense that there is certainly some timeliness or reason why Sir Tom uh, took on the, there are many, many reasons and might that also be one of them given what's going on in our world today. Um, hi, Emily. I wanna say something and that is, um, I think I might um, take your screen away from you, David, if I can manage it. And I just want to signal we have four minutes left and we do want to encourage people to consider the deep dive and the, so do you want to talk a little bit more about the deep dive, Charlie, because you, you mentioned it. Yeah, if I may, Emily. Um... Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you Graham School for hosting uh, this event and most especially thank you to you Emily and your team and and David, thank you, thank you. It's always such a pleasure. I, w I wish we could just stay on because I got so many questions. But Emily's referring everyone please to, I think there's a slide on your screen, uh, Court Theater, uh, because of course, we're not able to do live performance through the course of this fall is putting on a series of virtual programming. And one of them we've appropriately named the deep dive because there is so much to dive into. Uh, uh, professors John Boyer, Leora Al Alosander, Christine Merling, joined by David Levine, Tara Zara, and uh, Rachel Dawaskin will all be participating in a seven session seminar over seven weeks. And in that seminar, we also will share with you a uh, reading by professional actors of this play. So we hope that you can join us for that deep dive, we're also doing uh, similar virtual programming that will parallel the Graham School event that is this Thursday with Ken Warren and Rano J. Parson on August Wilson, 
uh, we're also we're going to be doing a, a seminar uh, on the world of August Wilson with Ron OJ, our resident artist, and Ken Warren. We're also planning a similar um, four day four session uh, virtual uh, seminar on Carol Churchill's play Fen on um, the Bacchae, uh led by Sarah Neuter and a direction, a directing of a reading of that play by Monty Cole. And then finally in the new year, our, our last one, I think I got them all is um, uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry's Le Blanc with um, uh, Gabby Randall uh, uh, and other scholars joining us. So I hope you're able to uh, participate in some of that virtual programming before we then bring on live performance back to the theater, God willing, and the circumstances on the ground allowing us starting in uh, February through the spring. David, do you have any final words? I, uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for for joining us. I'm I'm thrilled that we could convene if frustrated that we couldn't all convene in the same place, but very grateful to the Graham School and to you, Emily, and of course to Charlie for uh, allowing the conversation, uh, for inviting the conversation and allowing it to take place. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to the uh, deep dives that Court will be, uh, will be presenting. And we want to thank both of you um, it's really been a pleasure and intriguing and enticing to learn uh, from both of you and from your conversation and from reading, reading about the play in, in bits as we did. And I want to thank our audience and I do hope that you will consider uh, joining us on Thursday evening as we continue this focus on court theater here at Graham. Um, and of course, I can't have this many people in front of me without giving a little plug for some of our courses and our offerings. We have a great books program that brings people together and it's quite a devoted community of learners. And we also have a number of other courses, including one in the winter that's on Tom Stoppard. So if you were feeling like you wanted to do an extended dive, a deep and then extended dive into Tom Stoppard, you could do that through the deep dive at court and then continuing in winter quarter at Graham with studying more of his plays. And with that, we will sign off and I hope to see you on Thursday. Thank you for joining us. Thank you everyone so much. Thanks so much.